Happy Resurrection Day, Resurrection Morning, everyone. Hope you are in good spirits, in good health. We are Restoration Fellowship, the name of this ministry. This is our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. If you'd like to find out about us, just go to Believes. We have many other links, many other websites, thehumanjesus.org, Christ Enemy Love, and others there you can look at. So this morning we will we continue in the Gospel of John we've been doing. So if you're new to this stream, to this uh, Bible study, we go through certain books in the Bible. And we go chapter by chapter, read by Anthony usually, and giving his commentary. And now I'll introduce Anthony, and he will open with prayer as we begin this Sunday morning. Again, with the Gospel of John, we are in chapter 8, and then Youth Lesson uh, by Tracy. So good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Carlos. Thank you for that uh, good introduction and the amazing statements that you've collected there, propounding the fundamental truths of the Bible, which are not widely known. So yes, we will start by talking about the Shema. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to obey Jesus. And Jesus was asked in Mark 12, 29, what is the greatest, supposedly great commandment of all? And being a good Jew, and of course, he's also the instructor and teacher for us Christians, he recited the Shema, which goes like this in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which is, listen, Israel. We might say, listen, church, because we are the Israel of God now. The disciples, supposed to be, of Jesus, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Kyrios is estin in the Greek is one Lord. One is not a difficult word. Ask your child of two what the word one means, and he'll have no difficulty with it. But in church, this whole thing has become a nightmare of, of, of uh, very confused language contradictory as it sounds to our atheists and agnostic friends. So there it is. That's the creed of Jesus in Mark 12, 29. Teach your children that, and they sound like Jesus. And will also make a good impression on Jewish people, on Islamic people, who certainly find the Trinitarian idea of God quite foreign and quite uh, strange to what they've been taught. So there it is. Let me off, uh, offer a prayer now to the one God of Israel to introduce our morning service, asking a blessing on all those out there by the miracle of the internet. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this extraordinary miracle that you provided for us, the talents that you've given to men to discover and invent the internet, computers, and all this marvelous technology by which we can speak to each other across the world in different places, even in different languages. We ask your blessing upon all those who are gathered together on this Sunday resurrection morning to celebrate the beginning of a new week, the eighth day, which is the symbol of the great time coming when the kingdom of God will be established across the earth. For that day, we pray, as Jesus did and told us to pray, may your kingdom come speedily in view of the chaos that we now see in the world. We ask you to be with us with your operational presence and power, that of you, Messiah, at the right hand of the Father, and your spirit, Father, given to us in various forms, understanding particularly strength and energy to go forward. We commit ourselves now into your hands, ask your blessing on all those who speak this morning, upon the children's lesson and everything that is done and said in your name. May your kingdom come. We're praying in Christ's name as always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. As I said, Anthony will be back in a few minutes to continue. We are once again, the Gospel of John chapter 8. Before then, we have a youth lesson from Tracy Z from KOG Missions.
boys and girls, this lesson is not about politics. It is about God's morality. It is also about simple biology, since the world seems to be a bit mixed up these days. The question of the year is, what is a girl? One would think it is a simple question with a simple answer. Kindergartners used to know the difference between boys and girls. Even Disney used to know. They had boy princes and girl princesses. But today people are focused more on wars around the world, but we are in a more vicious war that we need to be focused on. You can't be neutral, young people or parents alike. You must pick a side to stand on. And I personally would rather be on God's side. I never thought I would have to do a youth lesson on this topic. And actually this is my second one. For thousands of years, people understood the difference between a boy and a girl. They understood that some boys like hunting and others like cooking, just like Esau and Jacob, but a boy is still a boy. They didn't think that Deborah must be a boy since she was a judge and accompanied the army into the battle. Unfortunately, today, people with big mouths are making the country think that people who were born a boy can decide that they really are a girl and the other way around. Schools are teaching students as young as five years old that they get to decide if they are a boy or a girl. Are you kidding? That's not something that you get to decide. God made that decision when you were still in your mother's womb. He brought that right DNA together just to make you. And that scientific data made you the gender or the sex that you are. If people think that they can change that, they don't know basic biology and they should never have graduated from law school, that's for sure. That is like saying that you get to decide what color hair you were born with if somebody asked you. Of course, you can choose to color your hair later, but the fact still remains that you were born with a certain color of hair. Just by coloring your hair does not change the real color of your hair. And if you look at the roots, usually you can see the real color. As a child or a young person, you can decide what you wear to school or what you want to be when you grow up. And asking a student what they want to be when they grow up is a normal question that's been asked for many, many years. But in asking them if they think they are a boy or a girl, that is not an okay question to ask anybody. Unfortunately, this question has become so difficult that a Supreme Court justice couldn't answer the question when she was asked to define what a woman is. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. And now they are trying to confuse you too. The President of the United States, teachers, and people who have nothing better to do on social media are telling you lies. They are filling your minds with nonsense. They take parts of scripture even at times out of context and then twist it to make it say something false. Yes, the Bible does say that humans were created in God's image and that's where they stop reading though. It continues to say that he created them male and female and he told them to manage the animals in the garden. And he also told them to make babies and fill the earth. A boy can think he's a girl all he wants, but he can't have a baby made inside of him and carry it and then give birth to it. Just like two boys and two girls cannot make a baby, simple biology, science tells us that this is so. Just like one plus one equals two. If someone decided that one plus one equals three, would that be okay? Or would you be considered having hate speech towards somebody if you said that that wasn't true. Unfortunately today, if you speak what is true, it is often considered hate speech to those who hate the truth. Again, we are all created in God's image, but we are not all created in a cat's image. You can purr all you want, but that won't make you a cat. Other countries laugh at us when they hear news stories. One school I saw, and who knows, maybe there are many more, put a litter box in the school restroom for the children who identified as furries. Young people, you are being attacked and exploited. And the sad thing is, is they make you feel empowered. But in reality, they think you're really stupid. 
they are putting their thoughts into your mind and making many young people think those thoughts are really their own. Young people, you must stand up. Be grateful for who God made you to be and be honest as to who God made you to be. Liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if you are living a lie, there is no repentance. But if we confess our sins and repent, it says that he is faithful to forgive us. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus came to offer an abundant kingdom life. Young people, you do not have to listen to the filth that they try to fill your mind and your heart with. And in fact, you must protect your mind and your heart. You do not have to read the books that are offensive to God. And those same books should be offensive to you as well. You should always be respectful though to those in authority, even if they are being used by the devil. You can raise your hand and ask to be excused. You can politely say that you choose not to read such books or look at such pictures. You may get made fun of, maybe by kids or by even the teachers, and you may get a failing grade, but in God's eyes, you will be a hero. Again, always be respectful. And the few children who are truly confused or who have accepted the lie, just like Eve did, should never be made fun of. You should pray for them. And if a friend confides in you that they're having these transgender thoughts, you can and you should gently and respectfully let them know what God thinks and that he loves them just the way he created them. Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? And then he lied to her as we see in Genesis 3. But today they don't even inquire if God said anything or not. They trash talk your parents. They make you think that that you don't need to obey, obey your parents or even trust them. They are stealing God's promise for so many children. And they not only steal the promise that God made for you today, but they steal and they will steal your future kingdom life if you are not careful. Some adults are finally standing up, but young people, you must stand up for what is right too. Not in a protest per se, but you need to stand up for your own moral and mental health and to honor God. How would the world function if everyone was identifying as a furry, sniffing each other and using litter boxes? People have exchanged God's truths for lies, but you do not need to be one of them. The world glorifies degenerate behavior and lifestyles, but that does not make it true, no matter how loud they yell nor does it make it right or acceptable to God. And it doesn't have to be acceptable to you either. How far do we go? What if I said I identify as a man? Many would say, oh, that's okay if that's who you identify as. But then if they're pressed further in this question or with any others, it seems to be a little bit more confusing as to what they would accept. What if I said I not only identify as a man, but as a black man? A lot of people were asked that question and when their response came back, it was quite humorous because they said, yeah, we'll accept you as a, a man, but not a black man. And when asked why, it was because they said, well, you're white. So that seems pretty obvious. So don't you think the other part would be? What if I said I identify as a Native American? Could I open a casino on their land? And what if I said that I was a black woman surgeon, even though I never went to school and I never studied medicine? Would you be racist then if you told me that uh, you would not hire me at a hospital? What if I identify as a nine-year-old? Should I get in Disney for a child's price? That is if I would go. And if I identify as a police officer, could I arrest you? You know, we could go on and on with examples like this. And we all know the answer that you can't do that. Words have meaning. Could I identify as having a different height or weight? I know some people would like to, I would, but what if I went to the doctor with high blood pressure and diabetes and my doctor wanted to help me, but I would insist that I am a skinny, healthy person. And so he couldn't help me. So many people scream about rights and especially women's rights, but they can't even identify one. They don't believe in gender, but they fight for rights of one of two genders. 
if a boy can say he's a girl, then why do so many say that men should have nothing to say if a woman wants to have an abortion and he doesn't? Then in the same breath, they tell you that if you're a boy, you can be a girl, even if you don't have a uterus. Do you see how crazy all of this nonsense is? We should not be willing to destroy common sense or to tell a lie or to accept a lie just so not to offend somebody. Many Christians used to teach about who we are in Christ, but unfortunately today, the world is screaming louder and really all that we're hearing is who or what we are identifying as. I encourage you to be real and don't feel the need to identify as someone or something else. Even if it's a girl wanting to be like another girl, just be you. Boys and girls, you are created in God's image. He created you just the way he wants you. The only things that you really can change are your attitudes, your thoughts, your words, and your actions. And if you want to identify as somebody else, identify as Jesus and try to be more like him. All right. Thank you, Tracy, for that uh, very powerful message. Much needed nowadays. I'm just reading some of the comments on the chat. And uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, let, let's just. Uh, uh, sorry. Let's just hope um, and pray that um, YouTube does not uh, suspend or even worse, uh, uh, band our account after, after this because they're doing it for this, these reasons as well, uh, as some of you know. So, but we, we have to speak the truth no matter what, right? So well said, Tracy, thank you for, uh, keep, uh, you keep raising the bar for teaching and, uh, and that this is good. And uh, Trace is part of, uh, as some of you know, Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions, kogmissions.com. If you'd like to check out her website, her ministry, and support her as well. Uh, she's, she has, uh, let's see, she has many contacts, as you can see there, worldwide. And also prayers for her work in, continuing work in Russia and Ukraine. As some of you know, she has many uh, context there. So thanks once again, Tracy. All right. Uh, let's see. Before we go back uh, with Anthony, again, we're on the Gospel of John. Actually, I my uh, sermonette is along the same lines as, as Tracy, funny enough. Uh, so this topic of, um, you know, uh, identity gender and all this stuff is obviously prominent right now. So I think the church needs to keep stepping up, if, if that's, a, that's a way to say it, on these issues, especially when it comes to the youth. And also as a reminder for us, um, adults, and especially those who call ourselves teachers and pastors. So I'd like to share something here as well uh, along the similar lines. And, um, the title of this is uh, The Collapse of Biblical Language. Matt Walsh is a conservative commentator who started as an online blogger and has recently gone viral by attacking what he terms the left's war on reality. More specifically, he is challenging the redefinition of gender and sex identity, what the government now terms, quote, trans rights. He spends most of his time making videos and giving public lectures explaining why and how, quote, this ideology has taken over the culture. In other words, how is it that someone who is born a male is now to be legally accepted by society as a female. In this clip from a recent lecture,
Mr. Walsh explained the first strategy used to, quote, infiltrate society largely through language. Okay, the trans agenda has infiltrated our society largely through language. And I don't mean that the gender ideologues use language to make compelling arguments. Not at all. Rather, they manipulate language itself. They, they talk about preferred pronouns, but a pronoun is a grammatical construct. It has to be deployed according to the laws of grammar, not the fickle whims of the individual to whom it refers. You know, if I'm, if I'm standing on this stage and you want to communicate to somebody else about the fact that I am standing on this stage, you will say he is standing on that stage. It would be grammatically and factually incorrect to say they are standing on the stage, as that indicates more than one person on the stage, which there is not. Prepositions, nouns, and pronouns, and verbs, I mean, unless they're used in a fictional story or poem or something, are usually meant to convey objective facts about reality. If they're not going to perform that function, then they no longer perform any function at all, and meaningful, useful words have been reduced to impotent nonsense. How crazy is it that, that this is what people think and that, we, that so many people just accept it? Second point, using an incorrect pronoun, incorrect as in a pronoun that doesn't properly convey objective reality, is not only nonsensical, but it's also dishonest. Now, I may be lying with the best intentions, but a lie is a lie. I am conveying an untruth. It's bad to convey untruths because the person I'm speaking to, whoever it is, deserves to know the truth. And if I don't think they deserve to know the truth, then I shouldn't be saying anything to them at all. And also the person I'm referring to deserves the truth, which is why if I'm talking directly to that person, I'm also going to use the correct pronoun. A confused and deluded person needs the truth. He doesn't need us to participate in and encourage his delusion. That might be what he thinks he wants, but it's not what he needs. It's not going to help him in the long run. But doesn't grammar and language evolve over time? That's the other thing you always hear. Well, it does. However, language evolves according to coherent rules and standards. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people making up their own rules individually, which isn't evolution. That's just the collapse of language. In order for language to work, there have to be shared rules that we all understand and agree to, and that makes sense. If you don't have that, then there's no way to communicate. This is a top-down change. The grammar rules are being changed proscriptively. Our cultural elites have decided for ideological reasons that we ought to be using different words and they are berating and scolding and punishing us until we comply. That is not evolution of language. This is an intentional manipulation of language, which is a very different thing. And yet the cultural elites keep using it and pushing it and pushing it, hoping that eventually people will submit and just start adopting it in daily use. If and when that day happens, they'll then turn around and say, well, look at that, language evolved. But calling that natural evolution, it's like injecting drugs into a lab rat and calling it natural evolution when it grows a third ear. That's not natural. Walsh, of course, is right to say that a pronoun is a grammatical construct that has to be deployed according to the laws of grammar, not the fickle whims of the individual to whom it refers. Prepositions, nouns, and pronouns and verbs are usually meant to convey objective facts about reality. But now meaningful, useful words have been reduced to impotent nonsense. And then he gives this example. It would be grammatically and factually incorrect to say they are standing on the stage, as that indicates more than one person on the stage, which there is not. Yet Mr. Walsh remains a zealous defender of the doctrine of the Trinity, a peremptory pontifical Catholic defender, no less. For example, over the years, he has tweeted out things like, the Trinity is definitely biblical. My whole point is that something can be biblical without being explicitly stated in the Bible. The Trinity proves this point beyond doubt. The Trinity is a biblical concept because it is in line with the Bible and can be inferred from it, but it is not explicitly stated. Words like consubstantial, eternally begotten, these are theological ideas developed in the centuries after the gospel was written. The Trinity is not an obscure theological theory. It's foundational to Christianity, and it's never once explicitly stated in the Bible. 
That's my point. Well, my point is that for whatever, quote, good, self-professed Christians or Catholics like Mr. Walsh may do, they would best serve society and indeed ultimately themselves by adopting that same logic they use for other societal issues when it comes to teaching about the God of the Bible. But the problem I see that continues to play Christendom is people leaving their brains at the church door. In particular, when it comes to telling the world who the one God of the Bible is and who his only begotten son is. The fact is that the so-called doctrine or teaching of the Trinity can only make sense as a mystical or spiritual experience. As the noted British author and former Catholic herself, Karen Armstrong wrote, in her New York Times bestseller, A History of God. The Trinity was not a logical or intellectual formulation, but an imaginative paradigm that confounded reason. For many Western Christians, the Trinity is simply baffling. Notable dictionaries and commentaries like the Oxford Companion to the Bible agree when they say that the New Testament offers no new doctrine of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is now the God and Father of Jesus Christ. Thus, all Old Testament theology is implied in the New Testament. Ultimately, let's go back to the words of Jesus himself in his prayer to his God and Father in John 17. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, that is the Father, the only true God. And note Jesus' prophetic last words of prayer using the Amplified Bible Classic Edition. O just and righteous Father, although the world has not known you and has failed to recognize you and has never acknowledged you, I have known you. And these men understand and know that you have sent me. I have made your name known to them and revealed your character and your very self. So I hope that's helpful. And um, it's just that I feel sometimes like the prophets of, of old and Jesus himself, right? And the big sin of the self-described teachers of Israel is their hypocrisy. There's this interesting story in Matthew 23 where Jesus actually tells the people to listen to what they say. Those who sit, as he says on Moses' seat, do whatever they teach. Uh, but actually, Jesus was against the hypocrisy of those self-styled teachers, not so much what they were teaching according to the old covenant law of Moses, although obviously Jesus came to change some of those systems and some, some of those laws. But yeah, I just feel like the prophets, you know, the, the, the hypocrisy I hear for whatever good uh, self-described Christians and others are doing out there for this very important issue that Tracy was talking about, gender and trans rights and so forth, indoctrination of children. For all the good they might do, uh, it's it's very hard to see the hypocrisy on the, on the other side of it too. So. All right, I hope uh, you enjoyed that. And now we will go to the Gospel of John. So if you'd like to uh, read along with uh, Anthony's translation slash commentary, go to the One God translation. I'll put it in the link. As you see there, click on Bible, then click on John. There are the books, and then here are the numbers. And we are in John 8, but I think, I'm not sure, let's see, uh, Jesus went out, okay, it looks like uh, Anthony in his translation, okay, you don't have the, um, the extra story there of the adulterer woman. So let's go to just a normal translation, the NRSV, because towards the end and at the beginning of John 7, 
in some of your Bibles, you'll notice there's an extra story about Jesus. Uh, let's see. Uh, some Bibles have it at the end of, starting at the end of seven, and others have it. Uh, oh, is it there? Hold on. I'm being told it is there somewhere. Uh, let me, sorry about that. Let me check this out. Yes, sorry, it is there. Or I was just seeing that some translations have it at the end of 7 2. So, anyway, it is there. It's the adulterer woman, and I'll hand it over to Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, okay. So, I'm more than thrilled and excited about what both you and Tracy did, and you added extra power to the point you were making by quoting from Matt Walsh. We need to get to him now because my dear Walsh, I would say to him, you are just committing the very thing you're, you're condemning. When you talked about the evolution of language and how people are abusing the precious power and talent of communication that we humans ha have, when you're condemning that, you're not condemning it in the Roman Catholic and Protestant system on the nature of God. So we need to get to this man. What an opportunity to speak to him. Doesn't he see that the language of God being three in one is an abuse of language? In one of our little clips that we put up often, we say, this is a chair, and this is a chair, and that's a chair. Well, that doesn't make one chair. But that's exactly what they're expecting you to believe in church. Now, they're often quiet about it because it's really an embarrassment. So ask your friends, why not ask the pastor, preacher, to preach on Mark 12, 29, as we do week by week, where Jesus, and surely he's important to you, you want to sound like Jesus if you're a Christian, Jesus quoted the Jewish Unitarian Creed. Every Jew, ask the rabbi, ask any of your Jewish friends. They know that God is one single person. Millions of Islamic people know that. Millions of Jews know it. But those claiming to be followers of the Bible are caught in a terrible abuse of language on this point. So I want to just, before I get into John chapter 8, which begins with the story of the woman caught in adultery, I want to go on record as reading this for you. What about John 1, 1? In the beginning was the word. Listen to what they were saying at Qumran, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls. What did Jews say typically, as we find in a statement in the Dead Sea Scrolls? I quote, by his knowledge, everything has been brought into being, and everything that is, God established by his purpose and apart from God and his purpose, nothing is done. Doesn't that sound like John 1, 1? Of course it does. An obvious parallel is right there. By his knowledge, everything has been brought into being and everything that is, he established by his purpose. Apart from him, nothing is done. I think that's absolutely brilliant. It shows then that John was a Jew thinking like Jews. Jesus was a Jew thinking like Jews in terms of who God is. All right, with that as prelude then, let's move to the seventh chapter, eighth chapter, I should say, of John. And it begins then with the story of the adulterous woman. He went out to the Mount of Olives. No, John 8. Here we are, yes. Beginning of John 8. The beginning of John 8. We have the story of the adulterous woman. The beginning of John 8. Not verse 8, but the beginning of John chapter 8. Can we find the beginning of that chapter there? Oh, here it is. Here we go. Uh, it, right. is, it is yes. there, Anthony. Right. The yeah, of course it is. Yes. He, went, he, he then uh, made his way to the temple complex, as he often did, and all the people were coming to hear him 
teach. We need to stress Sunday by Sunday the fact that Jesus was a teacher. The public has been misled to think of Jesus only in terms of one who died and rose. Now, of course, his resurrection and his death for our sins are absolutely, absolutely essential. We understand that. But what is not understood well by the public is that Jesus was firstly a preacher, teacher of the gospel. And this is what he was doing in the temple here, morning by morning, probably let's say six o'clock in the morning, he sat down to teach the people in the temple. So I want you to think of Jesus as firstly a great, wonderful, unique teacher, who also of course later died for the sins of the world and rose again. He sat down when he taught and began teaching them then, and there I don't see, uh, I can't see the next verse here because it's blotted out. Can you take that one new folder thing away there? I'll read verse three. From uh, yeah, let, let me help you with the reading there, Anthony, if you don't mind. So let's see. At dawn, he made his way to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to hear him teach. Jesus sat down, began teaching them. Verse three. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and made her stand in front of them. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. According to the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. So what do you propose? Verse 6. They asked this in order to trap Jesus so that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and began writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted with their question, he stood up and, and said to them, whoever is without sin among you should be the first to throw a rock at her. Verse eight, then Jesus stooped down again and continued to write on the ground. When they saw this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only Jesus was left with the woman standing with him. Verse 10, when Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She answered, no one, Lord. Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. So leave, but do not sin anymore. Okay. Yeah, we've got it there. Very clear. Now, that's certainly not in every manuscript, but it's well enough established that we can use it <clears throat> as scripture because the lesson is massive there. Jesus was talking to women often in the Gospel of John. You remember the lady from Samaria who said to him, well, we know the Messiah is coming, <clears throat> but I'm the Messiah. When Jesus said, I'm he, it's me, he meant not I'm God, quite out of the question. It would simply mean I am the Messiah. That's in John 4.26. Anthony, if you don't mind putting the... Uh... Yeah, the mic uh, <laughs> over your mouth. Okay, please, can we get rid of that? I've got a, I've got a, a something on my screen here. I'm and sorry, I can't folder. from here, but just fix your mic on over your mouth there, <laughs> yeah. if you will. But I cannot, sorry, fix your screen. Oh, you can't get the the new folder thing out of the way there. No, okay. <clears throat> no, sorry. Um, if you have I'm a fine. Bible, your Bible nearby. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, I have the New American Standard Version. Yeah, if you can just read from your <coughs> yeah. Bible, if you cannot see yeah. the screen. Thanks. That's right. Okay. Okay, what about this lady then? The issue is here, she should be stoned to death according to the law of Moses. That's what the law of Moses said. Now, Jesus is doing something very radical and teaching us a lesson that is well needed, much needed in our current time. Jesus here is showing himself to be so significant that he's actually abolishing the law of Moses in the letter here. He's breaking and teaching a breaking of the law of Moses. The law of Moses clearly said that adultery is to be punished by death. So this is a massively important lesson for many listening this morning who are not clear on this point. Jesus, I repeat, Jesus as the Messiah 
did not just follow the law of Moses in the letter. If he did, he would not have advanced beyond the Old Testament, and he certainly did, and this is one of those classic cases that John has included here in his, re in his narrative to show that Jesus is the new Moses, not just a copy of the old Moses. So I want to uh, open up that subject for you all to see very clearly. They said, well, look, the Bible says, the law of Moses says we're supposed to stone her. What did Jesus then do in verse six? They were saying this, of course, as John notes in verse six, to test him. Do you know the Bible is a huge lawsuit from beginning to end? God is the judge and man is the one on trial. And man nearly always gets it wrong. He's always guilty all the time. And Jesus comes along as the perfect human being who gets it right all the time. And Jesus has so much authority as the Messiah that he can actually change and alter the law of Moses, which he did right here. Look what Jesus did in verse 6. Jesus stooped down and with his finger he wrote on the ground. Does that remind you of anything? It should, if you know your Bibles well, you remember that the finger of Moses wrote the commandments of the old covenant. So Jesus here is reminding them of what Moses did by writing laws with his finger and the finger of God, in fact. And here Jesus is superseding the law of Moses in the letter and Jesus writing with his finger this would remind them of what Moses had done, as we find mentioned in verse 5, the Anthony, law of Moses. Yes. Sorry, if you don't mind, just yep. a slight correction. I think you mean the finger of God. Wrote yes, on the finger tablets. of God. Yeah. Oh, it's the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments. Right. Okay. It wasn't Moses who did the writing. It was God. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, Mount okay. Sinai, if that's what you mean. Yes, sorry. I, mem I, mean, I remember that exactly. I mean, I mean that, of course. Isn't that found in Deuteronomy 22? Is, is it worth just quickly glancing at that verse? Deuteronomy 22, probably. The finger of God. Exactly right. Written with the finger of God. Well, that writing with the finger, Jesus reminds them of the writing of God when he wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments in the letter. So this is a clear opportunity for Jesus to say, listen, I'm doing the law of Messiah. I'm teaching something beyond what Moses said. This is a classic example. Another one would be where Jesus was asked about divorce. And Jesus answered by saying, well, Moses gave certain reasons it doesn't matter what they are now because they're passe and finished anyway for a genuine divorce but i'm telling you something else so don't ever say that jesus just kept the law of moses in the letter if he did you're denying him his position as the minister of the new covenant paul also called himself the minister of the new covenant. So if you're following Jesus as a Christian, you need not to be following the law of Moses in the letter in every case. There are some cases where the law of Moses might be the same as the law of Jesus. That's true. But in this case, there's a huge change here where Jesus, exercising his unique authority, writes a new law. And here it is, don't stone adulterers. But what did Jesus say to the lady? Go and don't sin anymore. He didn't say it's all right what you're doing or what you've done. He didn't stone her, didn't require that she be stoned. Actually, the Jews didn't have the right to stone in the Roman Empire at that time. They, the Romans didn't let them stone anybody. But Jesus is confirming that you, you cannot stone the woman for this. But she's told to go and sin no more in verse 11. Does anybody condemn you? He says to her, no one. I'm sure she was excited about that. And Jesus said, I do not 
condemn you either. I am not insisting on the law of Moses in this case. Therefore, I, Jesus, am bringing in a new covenant. Just don't go and sin anymore. Now, there's another lesson to be learned here. You can imagine every human being as this woman. We've all sinned. We've all committed things against the law of God, whether it be the law of Moses or the law of Jesus. And the story for us would be God is not condemning us to death, provided we repent. But God is saying to all of us, and Jesus is saying to all of us, as Jesus sits now currently at the right hand of the Father, as the, my Lord, little capital, little letter L, not capital letter, but little letter Lord in Psalm 110, 1. Jesus is saying, go and sin no more. He's not condemning us. He's forgiving us if we believe in his truth, believe in his gospel and so on. But we better go and sin no more. Sin had better stop. Uh, let me forgiven. help you and read yeah. the next section there, Anthony, if you don't mind. And uh, you can refer back to your Bible. Verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me in my teaching will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Verse 13. So the Pharisees said to Jesus, you're testifying about yourself. So your testimony is invalid. <clears throat> Jesus answered, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is indeed valid because I know where I came from and where I am going but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You're using unspiritual human standards to judge. I am judging no one, but if I do judge, my judgment is true because I'm not alone, but I and the father who commissioned me are united in our judgment. Even in your own law, it is written that the witness of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies about myself. And the father who commissioned me testifies about me also. Verse 19. So then they were asking Jesus, where is your father? Jesus said, you recognize neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would also recognize my father. Jesus spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple complex but no one arrested him because his decisive hour had not yet come. I said that the Bible is a lawsuit book from start to finish. We are under the judgment of God. God is the unique judge who always judges accurately and always judges rightly. But not only that, God has commissioned, that's what I mean when I say God sent Jesus, God commissioned Jesus to be a perfectly valid, upright judge alongside of the Father. That's what we call the law of agency. In the Hebrew word shaliach means one who is sent. The whole point, I mean the whole point of Jesus is that he is a perfect representative agent of the one God. He has this unique relationship with the Father that everything that the Father wants to say, he says it through the mouth of Jesus. That doesn't mean, of course, that Jesus is God. That would make two gods, and that would break the laws of language, as uh, Tracy Zhikovic was saying just now, as Matt Walsh was saying, without really believing it because he's a Roman Catholic, so he took back what he actually said so well. But the laws of language require when Jesus says, I'm the son of God, I'm perfectly reflecting my father. What Jesus is telling us here in these marvelous passages in John's gospel is that he's a perfect son. That's what Adam was supposed to be. God created Adam and Eve to rule the world. Isn't that amazing to take charge of the world? And they failed dismally by listening to the twisted lying words of the devil. Just as people today in our time 
are listening to some speakers who are saying words don't have any meaning anymore. I think Carlos played that amazing clip that I hope you all saw of somebody who's recently been appointed to be a judge. And she was asked, could she define a woman? She said, no, I'm not a biologist. I'm, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a scientist. I can't do that. This is a low point for the human race. We are giving up simple language, and that's a very serious thing. Uh, sorry, so Anthony, that was yes. Tracy who played the judge uh, clip. Oh, Tracy. Tracy played it. Thank you. Tracy played that, but that was absolutely outstanding. I think we should play it every week. And what Matt Walsh said confirmed it so well that I thought this made the point exactly what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is speaking perfectly for his father. Everything the father says, Jesus says. Why? Because Jesus knows where he's from. He knows his origin. He's the son of David, that's a human being. And he's begotten, that means brought into existence. He begins to exist in the womb of his mother, Mary. So it would be nonsense to say that Mary is the mother of God. But it would be equally nonsense to say that Mary is only the mother of the body of Jesus, as a Protestant was saying in the early eclipse that we're showing. We need to absolutely discount that. Jesus is the son of Mary by miracle, by logical miracle. That's all it is. He's also the son of David, and he cannot be older than his grandfather or great, 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 great grandfather. You cannot be older than your own father. So that's what Jesus is saying so well in these early verses of John 8. And of course, it made the religious authorities very angry. They're trying to kill him. In verse 20, he spoke these words in the treasury when he was teaching in the temple, as we saw he began to do. But no one uh, arrested him at that point because his official hour for death had not yet come. There it is. So it wasn't the moment for him to be arrested and killed. And that's why that official final moment had not yet come. So that takes us then to the verse. Yep, I'll, that uh, passage. I'll do the uh, next section there, Anthony. Uh, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, I'm going away. You will search for me and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, is he going to kill himself since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? Jesus replied, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Verse 24. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. They asked him, who are you? Jesus replied, precisely what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have a lot more things to say to you, but the one who commissioned me is true. And what I heard from him, that is what I am announcing to the world. Verse 27. <clears throat> they did not know that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said this, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, the Messiah, and that I do nothing on my own, but just as the Father taught me, so I speak. Verse 29, The one who commissioned me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I continuously do what pleases him. Verse 30, as Jesus was saying these things, many came to believe in Jesus. Okay, what a marvelous uh, lesson for all of us from verses 24 to 30. You're going to die in your sins. That's pretty strong language. And he says it to us too. You are going to die unrepentant and sinful. You're not going to be saved if you don't believe what I say. Unless, I'm reading verse 24 now, you believe that I am he. 
Now, many of your friends will say, well, there you go. He says, unless you believe I'm God. That is absolutely false. The Greek for I am God in Exodus 3, where God speaks of himself, is I am the self-existing one. That should tell you that God is one person in Exodus 3.14. Jesus didn't say that here. If, in fact, he'd said, unless you believe I'm God, you'll die in your sins, they would have had a right to lock him up as mad or blasphemous. He didn't say that. So the key to the I am statements here, and I've taken the opportunity of actually inserting the word Messiah to make this clear to you, the key to all of the I am texts, we've got one of them in verse 24, and we've got another in verse 28, and many others, I am he, what they mean is, I am the Messiah. How do I know that? Because John, very cleverly, in chapter 4, verse 26, we need to turn that very, to that very briefly. In 4.26, Jesus said to the woman, another woman, incidentally, in the story, to the woman of Samaria, I, who speak to you, am he. Got it? I am he. I'm it. It's me. What is he referring to? The Messiah. Because in that very same passage, the issue is that he is the Messiah. So that's John 4, 26. I am he. Did I get the right verse? Verse 24. John 4, no, 426. Let me get this right for you. 426. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And the woman had simply just said in the verse before, in John 4.25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. That's the issue there. He was called the Christ. That's the Greek form of the word Messiah. And when that one, the Messiah, comes, he will declare all things to us. In other words, he will be our supreme teacher. He'll make everything clear. And in ver verse uh, 26 then of chapter 4, here's your key to the I am statements in John. John gets this clear from the start. 426, Jesus said to, to her, the woman Samaria, from Samaria, I who speak to you am he, the Messiah, not God. So make that quite clear to your, to your friends. Jesus was a unitary, Unitarian monotheist. We know that from Mark 12. He quoted the Jewish creed and the scribe along with him said, that's exactly right. So that's where we start. And then Jesus is the Messiah. So that takes us then to that uh, in, in, in chapter 8 up to verse um, 20 th or 30, but let me finish the verses just prior to that. He said in verse 26, I have many things to speak to you and to judge. He was a tireless teacher. I have many things. What I'm saying is what I've been saying to you from the beginning, he just said. There's no change. From the start, he declared himself to be the Messiah. But he who sent me, that's commissioned me, to be sent means to be commissioned. The one who commissioned me, who gave me my ministry, so to speak, the one who sent me is the one who gives me the words that I speak. Because I hear them from God. Whatever God says, I hear those words accurately, and I then pass them on to you and speak as God's agent. I'm speaking these words to the world. Jesus, you see, is the ultimate judge. Now, he didn't came, he didn't come, I should say, to judge at that stage. But wait and see. At the second coming, he's going to judge the world. And he's now recruiting others to be royal family with him. That's where Jesus, you remember, said very clearly, 
that the seed, the good seed in the parable of the sower, and you want to go back to the parable of the sower all the time, all the time, it's the basis of everything Jesus taught. He said the good seed are the royal family. And I'll throw this in for your study this week. The royal family, it was mentioned in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. The people like Daniel and his friends were nobility. They were royal family. That's the seed. They're the seed of the king. Well, guess what? Jesus is the ultimate king. So he goes around sowing the royal family. So if you're a Christian, you are noble family, royal family. You are then in training to be a royal ruler with Jesus in the kingdom. All that right. Takes us, then, um, take us we'll, up to 23. Uh, we'll continue 31. Good. That's mm -hmm. all right. Yes, please. Uh, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue my gospel word, then you really are my disciples <clears throat> and you will know the truth and that truth will set you free. They answered, we are descendants of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can... How then can you say you will become free? Verse 34, Jesus responded, I assure you of this, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain a member of the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. 37. I recognize that you are descendants of Abraham, but you're trying to kill me because my gospel word makes no progress in you. I speak what I have learned and understood in the presence of my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. 39, they said, our father is Abraham. Jesus replied, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But in fact, you're trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, the truth which I heard from God. Abraham certainly did not do this. <clears throat> you're doing exactly what your father does. They said, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. Jesus said, if God really was your father, you would love me because I originated from God and I have come here. I did not come on my own, but he commissioned me. Why are you incapable of understanding what I'm saying to you? It is because you cannot listen to and grasp my gospel word. Third, uh, verse 44, you are the products of your father, the devil and your desires to carry out your father's wishes. He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and has not remained in the truth because there is no truth in him. When the devil tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of liars. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you refuse to believe me. 46, who among you can convict me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why are you not believing me? The person who is from God listens to and grasps God's words. This is why you do not listen to those words, because you are not from God. Go ahead. And... Okay, that takes us up to verse 47. This is power-packed material. This is a black and white. Again, a judgment scene. God is the ultimate judge. Jesus speaks the words of God and people in general do not believe what Jesus teaches and therefore do not believe what God who gave Jesus those words actually says. The point I want to make to you this morning is this. When you read about the word of God in the Bible, the word of God, you're not reading about a synonym for the Bible as a whole. The Bible doesn't call itself the word of God almost never, if ever, I think never. The word of God is the word of the gospel. And you ask your friends, what is the gospel? And if they say it's the gospel of the kingdom, you're on the right track. They're on the right track. Now you're getting somewhere. 
So you always start in your discussions of the word that Jesus spoke about, about his own word. You start by going to the parable of the sower in, Mark, in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. Because the whole issue in Christianity, according to the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, the whole issue is, do you or do you not believe in the gospel of the kingdom? The issue is not, do you or do you not believe that Jesus died and rose? That's also an important issue, very important. But the issue is, do you believe Jesus when Jesus spoke his gospel word? So in my translation, I've tried to make that doubly clear. That when he says, I'm speaking the truth, in verse 45, when he, when he speaks of speaking the word, he doesn't mean vaguely the Bible. He means the word of the gospel of the kingdom. So you always want to go back with your friends to that parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, because the entire Christian issue is predicated on the gospel of the kingdom. And that passage, we won't look at it uh, in specifically this morning, that passage in the parable of the sower says that if you don't believe in the kingdom, you can't be saved. Everything I want to say repeatedly here is based on Jesus' own preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And John assumes that you understand that. He doesn't keep saying the kingdom doesn't need to because they know what his word is. They've heard him speak. And then he gets to be very direct with them in verse 44. He says, you people are of your father, the devil. That's pretty direct. You preachers, you people preaching falsehood are preaching for the devil. And the devil was a liar from the very beginning. The devil is a master of twisting words, of getting everything wrong. And that's what Jesus accused the religious leaders of his day of doing. So that's the accusation about the devil. He was a murderer, it says in verse 44, from the beginning. That's from Genesis when he lied to Adam and Eve. And he's the very opposite of the truth. There's no truth in the devil. The whole world, John said in another passage in 1 John 5, the whole world lies in the power of the lying devil. So you must expect that lies and falsehoods are the norm, if you like. You better be careful that you analyze what your pastor is saying to you. Is he lying to you in the name of Jesus, or is he speaking the truth? The truth is very, very important, as Matt Walsh was saying in the clip that was played for us earlier. Okay, the one who is of God in 47. The person who belongs to God, the genuine Christian person, hears and understands. That word hears always implies understands the words of God. There it is in 44. Understands, 47 I should say. He who is of God hears the words, teachings of God through Jesus. So you wanted to find a Christian a true believer, the person who is of God, who really belongs to God genuinely, is one who understands the words, plural, of God. And then he accuses his enemies as follows. Uh, For this reason, a... you don't hear them. You don't understand them. You're not of God. You don't understand the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Sorry, yeah. just a, a comment, a quick yes. comment here on, uh, to go Good. back to the I am he. Yes. On the Net Bible, as you see there online, uh, yes. we often use the Net Bibles for yes, its copious footnotes. Mm -hmm. On verse uh, 24, I am he, if you yes. click on uh, footnote 53, yes, and you go down here, it's got a good yes. section here. Mm -hmm. So it says, as you can see there, the Greek reads, unless you believe that I am. In mm -hmm. this context, there is an implied predicate nominative. Mm -hmm. That is the word he following yes. the I am phrase. What Jesus hears had to acknowledge 
is that he was who he claimed to be, that yes. is, the Messiah. John yes. 20, verse 31. This view is also reflected in English translations like uh, the NIV, if you yes. do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. Got it. The New Living Translation, unless you believe that I am who I say I am, and mm -hmm. CEV, if you do not have faith in me for who I am. I thought that was interesting comment. Well, yes, they're saying that it means I'm God. Is that right? No, no, the Messiah. He's the Messiah. They're agreeing, the agreeing with us. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then, yeah, they're they're in agreement there. So, all right, let's continue. Uh, we'll get to the climax here, Anthony. In verse forty-eight. Let me help you out with the reading. Verse 48, the big climax, the Jews responded to Jesus, we are certainly right to say you are a Samaritan and have a demon. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I am honoring my father and you are dishonoring me. Verse 50, I am not seeking my own glory. There is one who seeks glory and judges. I tell you, if anyone keeps my gospel word, he will ultimately not see death. Then the Jews said, now we know for certain that you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. But you say, if anyone keeps my gospel word, he will never experience death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Even the prophets died. What do you think? Who do you think you are? Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory amounts to nothing. My father, of whom you say he is our God, he is the one who glorifies me. <clears throat> you have never come to know him, but I know him. If I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar just like you. But I do in fact know him, and I keep his gospel word. Verse 56, your father Abraham was overjoyed at the prospect that he would see my day. He saw it. And Abraham rejoiced, looking forward to the future. 57. The Jews said, you are not even 50 years old yet, and yet you have seen Abraham? Jesus said, let me assure you on the highest authority, before Abraham ever existed, I am the Messiah. Hearing those words, they picked up rocks to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden and left the temple complex. All right, what a marvelous climax that is. And you'll see I've inserted the word gospel word there, the whole issue. Again, the parable of the sower is exactly the same point. The entire issue as between who's a Christian and who is not a Christian, the entire issue is predicated on, based on, dependent on, do you or do you not understand the gospel word of Jesus, namely the gospel of the kingdom? There it is in 52. Abraham died, and the prophets also. And you, Jesus, say, if anyone keeps my gospel word, he will never die. So what about that, Jesus? Abraham is dead, isn't he? Yes, but what they should understand is that Abraham will be resurrected and come back to life. So Abraham is the father of the faithful. He's a model Christian because the gospel was preached to Abraham. And that's very important to believe what Abraham believed because he was, so to speak, speaking as Christ before the time of Christ. <laughs> in verse 53 they say surely you're not greater than our father Abraham because they rightly understood that Abraham was the father of the faithful the gospel was preached ahead of time Paul said the gospel was the gospel of the kingdom that is was preached ahead of time to Abraham so Abraham is a very good model and Abraham will come alive in the resurrection. So in 53, the issue is, who do you say you are, Jesus? The prophets died too, they said. So what are you saying when you say that you're going to be living? Well, 
they didn't understand that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would be resurrected. And in 54, he talks about if he glorified himself, his glory is nothing. It's the Father who glorifies him. I get it. <coughs> of whom you say, he is our God. Note that the God of the Jews is in fact the God of Jesus. No difference, nothing to do with the triune or trinitarian God. The same God <coughs> for the Jews as for Jesus himself. <coughs> Not come to know him. You haven't come to know him. But I know him. And if I say I don't know him, this is very stinging, very telling. I'll be a liar like you people. But I do know him, and I keep his gospel word. The word, the word, the word is the gospel of the kingdom. That's the seed message which creates the royal family. And if you want to be part of the royal family, to be in the kingdom, then you must grasp the kingdom word that Jesus preached. Finally then, in 56, he says, your father Abraham, your spiritual father Abraham, rejoiced as he looked forward to seeing the days of Messiah, the days of Jesus. And he saw it and was very thrilled about it, as we should be, as we look forward to the yet future arrival of Jesus in the kingdom. Then the Jews then misunderstood that. You see, this is a marvelous piece of writing because it shows that the established religion could not understand what Jesus was saying. They were blinded and deafened, if you like, to these words. So the Jews said to him in 57, you're not even 50. You're not 50 years old yet, and yet you're claiming to have seen Abraham. Well, he didn't say that. He didn't say that he'd seen Abraham literally. He said, and they just misunderstand it because they're so obtuse and so completely confused spiritually, they misunderstood what Jesus said. So Jesus then clarifies it very beautifully. And he says, before Abraham comes to be or came to be, either one is possible. Before Abraham came into being, I am the Messiah. We've learned from John 4.26 that when he says, I am he, he always means I am the Messiah. So likewise in this text, John is very systematic. John, who was almost certainly a cousin, I think, of Jesus, that's not proven, but most likely. And John is the disciple whom Jesus loved particularly. And I think he loved the intense spirituality of John, which we find in the gospel here, before Abraham was born, came to be, it's possible to translate the Greek even there, before Abraham comes to be in the future. I am the Messiah. There's a slight ambiguity in the Greek language there. Doesn't matter. Before Abraham ever existed, I am the Messiah. That's to say, in the great word, plan of John 1.1. 1, 1. You remember we compared that marvelous statement of John 1.1 1, 1 with what they said at, at the Dead Sea Scrolls. The word is the purpose and the plan and the thinking, the logic of God. If you like the gospel, in the beginning was the gospel, translated that way. And that gospel was with God and it was God himself. It wasn't somebody else. So you've been lied to, if I may put it, bluntly, if you've been told that in the beginning was the Son of God, it doesn't say that. Jesus is the embodiment of that mind and purpose and plan of God. It says that the Word became flesh. That means the Word wasn't flesh, first of all. It became, just like the water, became wine. It wasn't wine first, but became wine. It was a miracle when Jesus was born came into existence in the womb of his mother, Mary, began to exist, and then he is the embodiment of God's wisdom, God's mind, God's plan, 
God's understanding, God's great idea, which is to reproduce children of the kingdom, brothers and sisters of Jesus, ones created by his gospel message in the parable of the sower. That's what Jesus is saying here, but you're supposed to understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke well before you get to John. The problem is people love to play out of John when they really aren't well equipped to do that without first grasping the profound truth, not only of the Old Testament, but of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this drove them absolutely crazy. Look at 59. When he said, I'm the Messiah, I'm he. Even before the life of Abraham in God's great plan, I am the Messiah, that made them frenetic. They picked up stones, just as they'd wanted to stone the lady caught in adultery too, picked up stones to throw at him. But it wasn't the moment for his death to come. I want you to get the full glaring effect of this passage here. The furious antagonism between the established religion, which was terribly mistaken, so mistaken, when the Messiah came, they actually tried to kill him. Isn't that shocking? You wonder, though, has everything changed very much? So we've got some good notes there, Carlos. You want to comment some of the notes in the Net Bible there? Uh, oh, yes, if you can see that yep. uh, now. Mm. Uh, mm. Just uh, on the word glad in John 8, 56. Yes. What is the meaning of Jesus' statement that the patriarch Abraham saw his day, that is, Abraham rejoiced? The use of past tenses would seem to refer to something that occurred during the patriarch's lifetime. Then they quote a rabbinic uh, source, Genesis Rabbah, states that Rabbi Akiva, in a debate with Rabbi Jonathan, held that Abraham had been shown not this world only, but the world to come. This would include the days of the Messiah. More realistically, it's likely that Genesis 22 lies behind Jesus' words. This passage known to rabbis as the, what's that, binding, tells of Abraham finding the ram which will replace his son Isaac on the altar of sacrifice and occasion of certain rejoicing. Yes, that's helpful. Jesus said that they had seen, or that he had seen, the days of Messiah, that Abraham had seen. Let me get this exactly right. The claim was that Abraham had seen the days of Messiah. That doesn't mean to say that Abraham literally saw Jesus, because Abraham wasn't born. So you must understand, we've mentioned this other weeks, that to see in the Gospel of John often means to understand. It doesn't mean to see literally. It means to understand and grasp. So Abraham had foreseen, understanding God's plan, the coming of the days of the Messiah. That's <coughs> the point there. They yeah. misunderstand it, but then that's what they do. If you aren't in tune with the Gospel of the Kingdom, then you're liable to a misunderstanding. Well, more okay. than that, more mm. than that, Anthony, specific to the story in John 8 yes. and those Jews, mm. uh, Jesus in basically saying they're, they were demonized. Absolutely. Uh, Satan, I mean, if someone says Satan is your father, mm -hmm. so it's more than, you know, just a sort of human level confusion. <laughs> it's these people are demonized. So uh, another point, yes. uh, as you have taught before, Anthony, to compare John 8, 58 to Hebrews 11. And if we read that uh, in context, we know it's about all the uh, great people of faith, like Abraham and other prophets, and even Noah, I believe it's mentioned, Sarah. And um, then we get to verse 13, and this is a good parallel to that John 8, 58, as you have taught. These all died in faith without receiving the promises, but they saw them, uh, maybe understood them, welcomed them from a distance, and confessed that they were strangers and foreigners in the land. So there's that. Answer. In the land. That's very, very good. Why don't we uh, put a, a cap on all of this, Carlos, today and turn to Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. This is very good for your notes when you're teaching John. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, in Christ, 
is Ephesians 1, 13. You, you Christians, also, after listening to the word of the truth. Note the sequence here. You first must hear the gospel of the kingdom. That's where you start. After you had listened and heard and understood the coming kingdom of God gospel, that's in verse 13 of Ephesians 1, the gospel of your salvation. That's a powerful word. That's the word which talks about your being indestructible and immortal forever. Is that worth worrying about? I would think so. Then he says in Ephesians 1.13, having also believed, I get it, you first must believe the gospel of the kingdom as preached by Jesus and preached by Paul. And then you are sealed. I love that word. Stamped with approval, sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of the promise of the kingdom coming. What a power pack verse is, that is. Paul, you see, is such a good teacher, but he assumes a lot of things that you as audience don't necessarily understand well. So the art is to get to the truth of these basic words. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for that. So we'll leave it there. And that's a great capper, as you said, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, really a summation of the parable of the sower. So you hear, you understand that, that seed, the message about the word of the kingdom. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and that is the promise. So, all right, we will restart with chapter nine next Sunday and we'll end this morning with a few comments as we usually do from our youtube audience on one of my debates with mr reese that was a very good presentation all the books in the bible do not teach the trinity they actually teach there is one god individual the father there are no books paragraphs or even one sentence that teaches there are three in one that should be enough evidence but humans are so flawed we stick to traditions when we should not. I just hope people will realize the Trinity is false and let go of all traditions. We would have a lot more peace in this world if we got rid of the Trinity belief system. May God bless us all. <clears throat> Amen. On uh, if Jesus is not God, who is he? Which was a talk Anthony had with uh, Greg Dybul. Some of you might know from Australia, former Church of Christ pastor, author of They Never Told Me This in Church. Rod says, Greg Dybul's logic is incredibly precise and stunningly persuasive. Wow. As a retired software engineer, I am impressed. Christ cannot be both with the Father and the Father. That's an oxymoronic, self-contradictory statement, I guess. Similarly, a woman cannot be with her husband, simultaneously be her husband. I feel the burden of 1,700 years of lies lift off of me, bringing me to tears of sublime joy. My goodness, what a compliment. Thank you there, Rod. Uh, on the video, who's thrown which God on Hebrews 1.8? Great video, very helpful, thanks. And thanks to you. Unitarian apologetics on baptism in the name of Jesus only or Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you for a sound doctrine. And that's a question we often get, by the way, uh, Matthew 28, 19. How should we, what should we say at baptism and so forth? So hope that helps. On the conference presentation this year by Anthony, Daryl Williams, a good friend in Texas. Wonderful message and hope, Anthony. Thank you, sir. Thanks to you, Daryl. Let's see. On uh, my debate with uh, Garza, is Jesus God in Psalm 110? Carlos, you got him at around the six minute mark and he knew it. I love how clearly you've broken this psalm down and shown how the Greek of the gospel authors supports the biblical unitarian view by saying kirio mu thank you for that which means my lord by the way so 
Uh, again, another one. I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure Garza is presenting a false dilemma, saying that since the Jews interpret it as Abraham, in other words, Psalm 110 is about Abraham sitting at the right hand. You must therefore reject their rabbinic interpretation, accept that it's speaking of Yahweh. This is erroneous. One can reject the view of Abraham and still accept that David is using Ladoni to my Lord when referring to the Christ. Any thoughts, doctor? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if Garza has answered, but uh, hope he sees that comment. Another one, this is a very popular debate, by the way. Um, this is from my actual brother, blood brother in Australia. Uh, thanks, uh, his name's Nelson. My brother, was it Tina, Tina Turner, that's a singer, who said, you're simply the best, keep truthing. Well, <laughs> thanks brother, that's uh, again, brother in Australia. Uh, another comment here, I forgot how many there were. Exactly, Carlos says, Stephen, the story of Pharaoh and Joseph is prophetic. Pharaoh appointed Joseph above all in Egypt, except for Pharaoh himself. God has elevated Jesus <clears throat> to a position above all others in heaven and earth. Above all but God himself, the apostle Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27. And actually, that's a great passage there, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, when the kingdom at the end is handed over to the God and Father. Uh, on a video about the old versus new covenant, <clears throat> I would like to hear more on this. My current church keeps the Sabbath, the feasts, holy diet or food laws, all kinds of stuff. My spirit says is nonsense from reading the Bible as a modern day Christian. I am not despising God's old law. I see it surely, I see it surely had a purpose, especially from that era to our current era. <clears throat> but the law of Christ is what I see being the new covenant. I think topics like these are extremely important to go into massive depth with that someone may have so much knowledge, understanding after the series, they could then free people who are under this bondage. You need insight to do this as these people use scripture and quite a bit of it, they simply twist it. Yes, and that's a good segue as we wrap up here to <clears throat> next Sunday. I have a debate on, on this topic of the law. Did Jesus break the Sabbath and hosted once again by our friend Josiah over at the Integrity Syndicate channel? Um, let's see, integrity, if I can bring it up here. <clears throat> so if he'll have it on his YouTube page and um, I'll provide the link when he has it up. It's against a, a, a person from the UK actually, LJ. And note the times there on the right, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard, so a bit uh, earlier than usual. 5 p.m. because the my opponent is in the UK. So the, this might seem trivial, you know, most of us obviously do not keep the Sabbath. Uh, most Christians understand we're in the new covenant, but there is a growing uh, Sabbatarian movement uh, that still prevails and, and disturbs a lot of our fellow non-Trinitarians. So, all right, uh, let's see. Before I forget, uh, let me advertise Keegan's book. So if you go to focusonthekingdom.org, our homepage, go to books in the links, and we have reprinted Keegan's The God of Jesus book. And there you go. So when you click on, on the title, it should take you to the Amazon page. <clears throat> Although uh, it is available, uh, even though it says tempor temporarily out of stock, you see there on the right, but it is stock. So they're bound to change this soon. Uh, but they do have uh, a reprints. We just got the shipment this last week. 
So a lot of people I see comments and, and other forums, I hear people asking about this book. So it is in stock. We have reprinted hundreds of copies. So please buy extra copies if you want for your friends, family. It's a very good book, very good tome. And you can order now. So you can place your order, even though it says out of stock, but you can order now. So, all right. Thanks once again, Anthony, for your time. And uh, let's close with prayer. Remember, please, uh, the situation there in Ukraine, as it continues to be a just awful situation there. Um, and um, yes, and prayers for our church family here as well. Some of us uh, going through some health issues. Uh, please pray for Barbara's cough. As you know, she's got this incessant coughing um, <clears throat> and um, healing for that and prayers for the warrants and the surgeries that have come about and our own families here. Father, we thank you for this time, the opportunity to do this on a daily basis for us. We're very blessed. Uh, we pray for those less fortunate than us. We thank you for your son and the great message and sacrifice, the shedding of blood on the cross that ratifies this new covenant. We rejoice over with the saints who are sleeping, but one day you will wake them up, Father, through your son, Jesus, and they will enjoy the kingdom to come. We thank you for Anthony, his health, Barbara. Uh, we thank you for Tracy, the youth lesson, and we pray for the children, Father, but more specifically, actually, for the parents. It is difficult to be a parent, period, but it's becoming more and more difficult as the present evil age gets even worse. And we pray for those parents, fathers and mothers who have to deal with all this bombardment of stuff. And um, please give them wisdom and the courage. We need courage at this time, Father. We need to gird our ourselves. Uh, men need to, you know, stand up fathers in their families and and not be afraid and no matter if we get canceled suspended banned you know whatever that's nothing but uh, we have to be out here and continue the good fight in the name of jesus we pray amen god bless until we meet again